We're here to post protest Foie and we stand in solidarity with activists all over the world. And we're here to speak out for the animals. Because violence is violence, and it is always violence. These people threaten my family. They used acid on my windows. All of them are completely destroyed. Animal Liberation Front crashed a Sonoma restaurant owned by renowned chef Laurent Manrique. They shot video of Manrique's wife and child through the window of their home, leaving the tape and a warning. Small notes said, you know, we're watching you, you know, uh, stop or you will be stopped. Violence was used. There was an attempt to coerce them and their way of thinking and, and the way they live their lives. And that is terror. In 2004, the state of California passed a law banning the sale and production of foie gras. That law was called SB 1520, and it went into effect in 2012. On January 7, 2015, that ban was overturned. And now chefs can sell foie gras at their restaurants that's produced outside of California. Munchies has been documenting this controversy over the last eight months. We spoke to chefs, consumers, animal rights activists, and politicians to see what was happening in California. So why is foie gras so interesting? Because reasonable people disagree. If you would close your big, ignorant mouth long enough to hear the answer, well, you're vegan and you have a vegan agenda. Shame! Shame! Shame on you! Government regulation of the food we eat is nothing new. But one of the most controversial regulations is the ban on foie gras in California. Foie gras is the fattened liver of a duck or a goose. And this is something that can only happen if the duck or the goose is force fed. This process is done until the liver grows from being about this big to being about this big. This practice dates back to ancient Egypt and is a cultural tradition in France. Animal rights activists see this practice as torture, while chefs and producers insist that it is standard animal husbandry rooted in centuries-old tradition. There are some people who believe that you can produce foie gras without force feeding, but this hasn't really panned out. So for all intents and purposes, Foie gras involves force feeding. More than a dozen countries have banned foie gras production due to its reliance on force feeding. In the US, California was the first and only state to outlaw the sale and production of foie gras, but diehard fans found loopholes to get their hands on it. Under the ban, it was illegal to sell foie gras in California, but consumers were permitted to purchase foie gras from out of state. So it's not just chefs. Foodies are so passionate about this issue of foie gras that they actually do things like start speakeasies where they buy foie gras and sell tickets to semi-legal events where foie gras is available. So I'm here to find out what that's all about. Uh, I'm gonna meet with Tracy Lee from the food website Dish Crawl. Tell me about how this works, the foie gras speakeasy. Yeah, so um, we love to throw cute little underground supper clubs and it's just about gathering a bunch of friends together and I'm really excited we get to do foie gras, especially since it's illegal now. Is the ban just make it more enticing for people or is it is it kind of good for speakeasy business to have something that's illegal that you can provide this way or not? From a consumer perspective, if you do it for the public and you're a corporation, it's sort of a no-no. A lot of my chef friends have um, really been, I mean, just getting sued, you know. Okay, we have to shut this down. And it's, it's becoming a federal thing. A lot of people would, you know, sell a plate and then you get some foie gras to go with it. Sure. Or you just get foie gras anyways. And you don't see that so much anymore. And now is the possession illegal or just the selling it's illegal? It's just the selling. So it's not like, you know, it's not, I guess, pot's legal here to possess too, huh? Describe, why is it so delicious to you? It's buttery, it's fatty when it's pan seared. It just has a really nice texture and layer to it. I mean, it's just so decadent, you know? And I love that it, you know, I love drinking it with a muscat or different things like that, adding those sweet elements. And it's fair. It's perfect. I mean, I... I'll step back now, Look at she's that. got the hang of this. Oh my God, I want it. Woo, do you guys see that? All right, let's eat, guys. Let's eat it. Um, what, what would it take to stop you from eating foie gras? Could anything stop you from, from wanting to search out the foie gras? Not really. I mean, that's like asking me if I want to eat sugar. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what they don't realize is if you want to get something, there is always going to be a way for you to get it. Foie gras ban in California clearly has not shut down all the foie gras consumption here. Has it added to the allure of the product? Probably. Has it made some people who wouldn't necessarily care about it or search it out, search it out? Probably. I got more foie if anybody wants it. I'm here at the Farmer's Market in San Francisco to talk to Chef Richie Nakano about his feelings on the foie gras ban. He has taken on himself the burden of going against the ban. So even though it's illegal, he's gonna continue to serve it. Richie gets around the ban by offering foie gras by donation instead of selling it. If he were to get caught, it would be a thousand dollar fine. And so I just kind of want to see why he thought it was important enough. So tell me a little bit about your setup here. So we're a noodle stand at the farmer's market here at the Ferry Plaza. Um, we've been around for four years. It's market driven ramen, utilizing whole animals seasonal produce, organic vegetables. I'm just trying to take like a craft approach to making ramen. So how does foie gras fit into ramen? I mean, for us, uh, it's just an ingredient we love working with. For me as a young cook, it was a privilege to get to use that in the kitchen. I mean, it is the most rich, unctuous, luxurious thing that you can put on, on, on anything. There's nothing else like it. What kind of heat do you take for doing this? A lot, mostly online, mostly on Twitter. I mean, I've gotten death threats from people. One guy said he was gonna skin me alive because we were, because we were doing this, so. So, I mean, do you take any of that seriously? Do you worry about it? No, we usually like favorite it or re retweet it, you know, <laughs> nice. so. The fact that you're serving it after the band, does that make your customers want it more? Absolutely. The first time that we served it after the ban, we sold out in about 10 minutes. So people know we're going to have it. They ask all the time if we're going to have it. And if we do, there's a line before we even start. You guys eat foie gras? I do. You want any of your ramen? Sure. Zero dollars? Okay. Okay. It's a foie gras alarm. It's a foie alarm, yeah. When the band came in, describe kind of your feelings. It was f mostly frustration, and if anything, it only made me want to serve it more. So you really feel that it's worthwhile to go against the band? I think it's worthwhile. I think it's a fight that's worth fighting. Because I feel like you start with foie gras and sort of what's next? What do we ban next? What gets taken away next? And for me as a chef, I don't want to be told what I can and cannot cook with. I'm responsible. I make those choices myself to make sure I'm giving our guests the best product available. So San Francisco is not only a gastronomic center of California, it also happens to be the district for former Senator John Burton, who is the person who brought the foie gras bill to the Senate. And I want to know, how does that happen? How does government intervention even start? What's the kernel? My name is Guillermo Gonzalez, and I am uh, a producer, the only producer of foie gras in California. I have been in the business of foie gras for 20 years. Sonoma Foie Gras was the only farm that produced foie gras here in the state of California and was the only farm put out of business by SB 1520. Like, they're gone. Like, Guillermo Gonzalez's business, over. We're talking about a guy that came to this country to escape a civil war in El Salvador. To only have his family's lives threatened here in the United States. And I really wanted to talk to him because I thought he could really put together some of the pieces of the puzzle that I still don't feel that I have. I've tried repeatedly to get in touch with Guillermo Gonzalez. He really just doesn't want to participate in this documentary at all. And after several attempts, I finally got you know, this message. By now and after my absence of follow-up and communication, it is apparent that I missed the step you were inviting me to take and participate in your foie gras documentary. I regret I have to decline for good, but look forward to seeing your coverage of the story through a balanced perspective. Gratefully, Guillermo Gonzalez, Sonoma Foie Gras. Clearly, whatever happened wasn't pleasant. So if Mr. Gonzalez won't talk to me, I guess I'll just have to talk to all the other players that he dealt with during the debate leading up to the ban. 
So while some people are against the foie gras ban, some people are strongly for it. Like Brian Peace, the animal rights activist, whose early videos sparked a lot of the debate on foie gras here in California. How did foie gras even show up in your mind, like this is what I should do? Foie gras was something that you, know, you didn't hear a whole lot about. And when I did hear about it, um, I thought, well, that, that's something that's so extreme. That, that, should, that can't be allowed to be going on. That just has to be banned. And I heard that before SB 1520 was proposed, there had for years been legislation proposed to ban the farm here in California from force feeding ducks. But it never got anywhere. And they just said, well, the, you know, the ducks are fine. They're not being mistreated. But nobody ever really knew what was going on in these farms. So I thought, well, maybe if we can get in to this farm and actually document what's going on, maybe that will expose it and, and create some, uh, some momentum. You're watching ABC 7 News at 6.30. An animal rights complaint over an expensive gourmet delicacy. The ABC 7 News I team has an exclusive look at how that stuff is made. These three activists shot more pictures of ducks clinging to life. This one too weak to hold its head up. They took four of the worst ducks to a veterinarian. Gonzalez says he will try to have the activists prosecuted. We believe that the farm owner should be prosecuted for animal cruelty. I need to stress, highlight, and underline that the images that have been distributed for your information from the supporters of the bill are images that were taken in the process of committing a felony, in the process of committing a crime, and that it is a stage video. A lot of people on either side of this issue, frankly, have never been to an actual foie gras pharmacy. So you have on a number of occasions. Why don't you talk to me about that experience? The first thing when you walk in, it's just the, the sheer size of it. I mean, the, these are massive factory farms with thousands of ducks in each shed. And they're in these elevated pens where there's maybe uh, 10 or 12 ducks per pen and they're on these slats so their feces and urine just, just falls below them so it's just in kind of this, this filthy environment and they're all universally panting for breath from the, the pressure on their organs and just being having been force fed for this, this length of time. The conditions were just so horrendous for these ducks that were being uh, force fed by with the machines, uh, pipes being jammed down their throats and pumped full of uh, massive quantities of food to deliberately make them sick, to make their livers 12 times their normal size. So they're in a pretty sick state. That's just not the way that most people agree animals should be treated, even if they're raised for food. The activists found barrels of ducks that died before their livers could be harvested, others still barely alive. They also watched ducks too weak or overweight to defend themselves against the rats at Sonoma Foie Gras. Rats were eating these two ducks alive. You can see evidence of similar battles on several other ducks. So talk to me about rat eats bloody duck butt. These ducks had bloody rear ends and they were kind of limping around and, and they're using their wings to sort of balance. And then this rat would come out and just kind of nibble at them and, and go back in. And so I didn't think that was going to be the most compelling footage. I thought the force feeding was going to be the most compelling footage. But I guess that really caught a lot of people's attention because maybe people think it's disgusting to have a rat in a farm and eat it. it's kind of something out of a horror movie, I guess. I mean, to us it was kind of like this whole thing is a horror movie. When Brian showed me the video footage that he had gotten from Sonoma Foie Gras, you feel uncomfortable. Like, you, no one wants to see an image of the duck in bad shape. But are these ducks in bad shape because of one unclean farm? Let's say we walked on a cattle farm. Would we have the same reaction? Most people have no clue about how animals are raised for food. It's not always pretty to see how our food is fed. So now the question is, is force feeding a problem? I'm here to meet Dr. Elliot Katz, the founder of Indefensive Animals, to learn about the production of foie gras from a medical and biological standpoint. Why don't you tell me a little bit about the technical aspects of foie gras production and kind of what your main concerns are from a medical issue? If you equated it to a person who weighed about 150 pounds, forcing into a person's mouth approximately 30 to 40 pounds of corn mash or food, this excessive food causes the liver to gradually expand. As the liver expands, what you've got is a situation where the, the liver basically starts to degenerate and it doesn't do the function that it's supposed to do of getting rid of the toxins and poisons. Eventually what happens is the birds go into seizures, diarrhea starts, vomiting starts, and they also lose their balance. It's sort of like somebody who's been an alcoholic for years. They finally kill the birds and they kill them after they've gone through probably three weeks of total suffering 
but to get as much money as possible from as many birds as you can of that enlarged liver, you want to take it as far until you see that they're about ready to die. It's cruelty to bring any being to that level where their, their body is just uh, falling apart and they're being internally poisoned. It reminds me of Nazi Germany where they put the prisoners in concentration camps and starve them to death. Well, this is almost the opposite. So how did you get involved with foie gras and the raising of animals for meat? Right. When Brian Peace, uh, the founder of APRL, Animal Protection Rescue League, I had done an undercover video uh, at Sonoma Foie Gras. And I saw the video, and at that point, his organization was very small, and he was being threatened with a lawsuit for them going in undercover or inappropriately to the video. I called him up and said, I will, in defense of animals, will help cover your legal fees if you get sued. And I saw the situation further as a veterinarian, and I said, to me, there's reason to file an animal abuse lawsuit. Let's put the guy out of business or let's do whatever we have to do. So essentially our lawsuit was seeking to stop the force feeding and argued that it was a violation of California's animal cruelty law. And as a result of that, the farm here in California actually went along with the legislation. So we crafted a legislative compromise where they got the benefit of a seven and a half year phase out period during which time they could continue their business practice. They got immunity from our lawsuit. And then at the end of that, the production as well as the sale a foie gras that's made by force feeding. This is now illegal to sell in California, not just to produce. You had a lot of help from Burton, who's very high up. That ended up being the ace in the sleeve right there. I don't know if you've met uh, John Burton or talked to him at all, but when he saw this, he just, you know, he was at the time the most powerful, other than the governor, the, probably the most powerful politician in California. He was the president of the Senate, and he just pushed it through. But even with his backing, it still wouldn't have gotten out of committee had we not had that legislative compromise that caused the farm to actually go along with it. You weren't a lawyer when you started this, you are yeah. now. I was probably more of an anarchist who happened to be in law school. <laughs> right, fair. Uh, I didn't think laws could actually work. And then this was actually one of the things that made me realize, wow, you actually can make change. You can go through the democratic process and you can use litigation and legislation and education. It actually works. The process can actually work. So. To hear Brian talk about it, he was just a kid who found out there was something wrong going on in his mind, the production of foie gras and he traced down where it was and he's like, well, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna bring this to the light of day. Don't you know it? It got picked up by a local news station. Then Dr. Katz that we met with picked up on, provided some monetary and legal support. And then it just kept spooling from there. Went to the Speaker Pro Tem of the California Senate, John Burton, who introduced a bill. And lo and behold, you end up with a foie gras ban, not that much later. Not all veterinarians agree on the medical and biological facts of foie gras production. I was asked to walk through the farm at Sonoma Foie Gras um, last week. Uh, my first visit was within 24 hours of being asked to be there, so I believe that no special accommodations could be made. I found no substantiation for the claims that the proponents are making as to what debilitation the force feeding causes. Veterinarian was spoken to already, not a bird specialist. Okay. His opinion was that it's inherently torturous to force feed a bird, mm -hmm. duck or goose specifically. Why don't you tell me as an actual bird expert, okay. what do you think about that? First of all, birds in general don't have a gag reflex, and we humans do. So for us, we anthropomorphize when we see something going down a bird's throat, but it is not anything that's distressful to a bird. The opening to the airways is up at the base of their tongue. There's way more space there where the tube goes by it, and it's not blocking their airway. And I do know that force feeding is done in sick birds, sick ducks, and it's not anything that's harmful or we wouldn't do it in a sick duck. Right. The other thing is that they have, as waterfowl, because they're migratory, or at least let's say their ancestors were migratory, they have the ability to put in fat on their body to allow them to go long distances with a lot of exertion and have the energy for that, the, the reservoir for that. And one of the places where they store fat is in their liver. And so the foie gras people are taking advantage of that physiological feature and giving them a high energy food that will deposit a lot of fat into their liver. Were you able to observe one that was at the end of yes. the? 
Got a lot, and what was your, tell me your opinion. Okay, so the, the birds that they told me that tomorrow we're taking those to the processing plant, they were not acting distressful as far as breathing, anything like that. They were bright and alert. It's just they didn't do much standing and walking around the pen. And so my point of view is that that's probably not that big a deal for a bird to feel too heavy to stand for a day. So if it was like a weeks long thing. Yeah, then, yeah. then, then I would consider that not okay. I was told that the droppings of these ducks, it's fundamentally diarrhea and that that's another sign that their welfare is bad. What do you think of that? Their, their droppings are poorly formed. I wouldn't call it diarrhea because they don't get a lot of roughage. If they were having a diarrhea problem, they would be getting um, sores or they would be getting like dirty feathers back there and there was no evidence of clinical problems there. You know, that's another thing they point to is they say that when the ducks go into the barn, into the gavage, they are bright and nice looking and then by the end their feathers are dirty. They say, they say that they do have sores, that, they, that their feathers around their neck are all messed up. I didn't see that there. S strictly speaking about force feeding, what, what are your feelings on its impact on animal welfare in ducks and in geese? Okay, I've only seen it done at Sonoma Foie Gras, and I would say that what I witnessed there was humane and that they got a bum rap. So you actually testified in the hearings for the Foie Gras ban for SB yes. 1520. What was your feeling about those proceedings? The biggest criticism I had was going after foie gras in California was one producer and one ranch and, and just painting them with the same tar brush as operations in other states when of the senators there. They hadn't been to any of those operations. How could they say his treatment was inhumane if they never saw what was going on there? And so I felt like it was a prejudicial decision. It's important for me to come here to Sacramento because this is actually the hub. This is where this bill was passed. I'm meeting with Liz Figueroa because I need to talk to someone who is actually involved in the legislature at the time that they were making this bill. Item number four, which is SB 1520, which we will now be hearing. Senator Burton, you may begin. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, as a member of the committee. We are talking about force feeding in the humaneness of the act. Hi. Hi, how are you? Hey, I'm Dave. Hi Dave, nice to meet you. Why do you think Speaker Burton was so interested in this particular subject? Well, there are two subject matters people get very passionate about in Sacramento. One is how we take care of our animals, and the other is what we're putting into our stomachs, into our bodies. I mean, chefs really see it as someone trying to legislate what they can cook and what their customers can eat. I'm a progressive Californian and I still believe that people have the choice to eat whatever they want and we should provide that opportunity. What California does that others follow. How did the bill initially come to the committee? It's a business, so business and professions, that type of bill would come to my committee. And as chair of that committee, I had had several conversations with Guillermo Gonzalez, who owns Sonoma Foie Gras. And one of the reasons is that my family is from El Salvador. I was very excited when I knew this was a businessman who had done very well in the Sonoma area. He had hired a number of people, and I understood that he came during the wars of El Salvador to the United States and was a successful businessman. So I gravitated to him because I knew the humanitarian work he had done in El Salvador. So people were very proud of him, and I wanted to meet him. I told him that I would not vote for the piece of legislation and that he would need to work on the various committee members. So I think he was here at the Capitol for some time trying to educate legislators as exactly what the process to making foie gras. Wow. Did you go to the farm? No, I did not. Why do you think he was not successful? You can only do so much. It was one business. It's not like you had five businesses in California or ten. We had some a restaurant organizations, but all in all, he was fighting it by himself. How often does the Speaker Pro Tem introduce a bill like that? Is that unusual? You know, politics is, becomes personal sometimes. It was, became personal for him because so many of 
his colleagues or people that he cared about cared about this issue. By the way, Mr. Burton is right across from us in the black shirt. Right. Looks like New York. Right. right across from you in the black shirt with the white hair. Sorry if I interrupt you a second time instead of interrupting you uh, while you're talking. My name's Dave. We're doing a documentary on the foie gras ban. I'd really appreciate if you would say a couple things to me on the bill that you brought. John Burton was the most powerful man in the Senate and also the sponsor of SB 1520. Clearly the key player in the Senate in the passing of the foie gras ban. Senator, thank you so much for taking the yeah, time fine. to speak to us. So SB 1520 was kind of your baby. It's what I'm told that you were very personally passionate about it. Uh, what, what made you so passionate about the bill? Well, well, not that I just don't think they ought to torture animals to give people some food that probably isn't really that healthy for them for openers. How much did you know about the actual production of foie gras before the bill came in? Well, I knew about it years ago because somebody sent me pictures of cramming food down a goose's throat in France. I hear, although I don't know it for a fact, but there's a farm in North Dakota that makes foie gras and they have the, the ducks, the geese, free ranging and uh, it works. But they still use force feeding but they're gentle and they do it in very small quantities. Would something I, like I that don't know be acceptable? If they do for, it was my understanding that they eat the stuff off the ground like they do there's a place over in Spain where they gobble up the feed on the ground. Did you visit Mr. Gonzalez's farm during this? Or? I have no reason to. Here's actually my real question. Do you think it's a slippery slope, like first banning foie gras to eventually banning meat production altogether? I mean, do you think it's, do you think we're eventually on that slide? That's a dumb question. Well, it's not really, because we have Proposition well, me, 2 now. Well, Proposition you, 2 what? Says that you can't fucking create a bunch of animals together, you can't cut off uh, little calves' legs, so sure, to be all good stuff. Deal ten so, am I serious, Christy? Wait for a minute. Uh, no. That's all good stuff. Well, I don't think my answer is I don't think so. So you don't think it's a slippery slope? I just said I don't think so. All right. That's probably why I didn't want to do this shit in the first place, okay? Because it seems silly. But you thank see, you. Wait, I'm wait, out wait. of here. Wait, why does it seem silly? I don't know. Silly's in the eye of the beholder. Okay, I gave you my opinion. I appreciate That's it. That's my opinion. All right. I got to see my girlfriend. All right. Thank you. After going to Sacramento to meet with Senator Liz Figueroa and former Speaker John Burton, I still have some nagging questions. I don't understand why the Senate was so eager to push the foie gras ban through. So I've come to Stockton, California to meet with former Senator Mike Machado, who is not only there during the foie gras fight, but is also a farmer to get his perspective. I had the opportunity to uh, visit Mr. Gonzalez's operation. <clears throat> and I did so during a feeding period. And some of the descriptions that have been given in testimony were not borne out in practice. All right, Senator, thanks for meeting with me. And on the way to your orchard, let's talk about kind of the foie gras ban. Senator Figueroa's position was that everyone was on board and that the senators ended up pretty much in agreement. But I don't know, it just didn't strike me as being 100% of the story, which is why I wanted to come talk to you. It's 100% from some perspective. <laughs> <laughs> what was interesting about that is the farm that raised the, the duck for foie gras was in my district. And I think I was the only one that took the time to go out and visit the farm and to see the practices that were being used to raise the ducks. That, I think, was a disappointment from the rest of my other colleagues not taking that kind of an interest. Because I think any time you take legislation that's affecting the livelihood or, of, of, of people or affects an industry, you really have to research it so that it's not a knee-jerk reaction to the whims of somebody who says, well, maybe I don't like it, I want to get rid of it. What was your impression of the practices at the farm? What did you feel when you went to visit them? I thought it was very humane. What they were doing didn't look painful or out of the ordinary. It, is a, it was a practice that one would look at and say, well, it's not much different than a feedlot feeding cattle. The place was very clean. There was good sanitation practices that I would think, having gone through, from my pers perspective, good agricultural practices 
for certification for my food products that I serve, this type of operation would probably meet the same standards. Right, and it didn't seem like something that they were faking or putting on like a, just a show or whitewashing it for your presentation, at least not that you could tell? No, no, and I, and I, knew, I knew the farm manager. Um, our kids went to uh, preschool together. So I mean, I knew the practices. And it wasn't, you know, it was just saying, hey, I'm coming by, and I showed up. It wasn't something that had a lot of uh, lead time, and I saw what they did on a normal day. If you had eggs for breakfast, they came from a layer operation. If you had bacon or sausage this morning, it came from a confined feeding of swine. If you had a chicken sandwich for lunch, it came from a broiler operation, again, a confined feeding operation where the animals are fed beyond what they would eat and be in normal forage. If you ate beef, we're gonna have beef tonight. That usually comes from a confined animal feeding operation where they're gonna be fed well beyond what they would get in a grassland. Were you surprised that the bill passed? Oh no, look at the cast of characters. You know, you have the pro tem that's championing the bill and his job is to marshal votes. And so if you're a Democrat, there's a lot of things that come your way if you're cooperative. And if you're not, other things can come your way. That's politics. You see that in any legislative body. You see it in Washington today. How hard was Senator Burton hitting on this one? For whatever, whatever reason he developed this passion, he was very adamant about trying to be successful with his bill. And in this case, I think it was wrong because it put a man out of business and it did away with an industry. Had another legislator picked up that legislation? it probably wouldn't have passed. The bigger problem is not so much the particulars of the bill. The bigger problem is that type of a ban, without considering all the ramifications from it, can lead us down a slippery slope to where we will see more actions taking place without looking at the ramifications, and pretty soon somebody wakes up and says, well, what happened? Why is it not available anymore? Because today it's something you don't care about, tomorrow it might be something you do care about. Yeah, or if it could be, you know, people all of a sudden decide that they don't like the way uh, cows are slaughtered. You know, what's, what happens? What I realized doing this documentary is there was no way that I was going to really know what I felt about force feeding, about gavage, unless I went to a farm myself. First of all, Sonoma Foie is out of business at this point. So I can't visit Sonoma Foie, which is the only farm that was actually shut down by this ban. We tried to get permission to film the force feeding process in the two farms that are currently operating in New York State. And for whatever reason, they didn't want to participate in this documentary. So I'm going to go to someone who produces it in a very small way, in a very artisanal way, to see kind of what foie gras can be in its best light. I'm here at the Elevage Buissou in the heart of the foie gras region in France, Dordogne, to see how it's done. Hey, I'm Dave. Hi, I'm Nathalie. Welcome in La Ferme du Buissou. I've come because I really want to learn about the process of making foie gras from the beginning to the end, first Yeah. Time. The geese come to your farm when they're how old? One day old. So like? Oh, like this, very small, and they are very fragile during one month. They stay inside, and then we go to see them they are outside all day long. All right, well in the US, all foie gras is made from duck. Yeah. Here in France, a lot is made from duck too, but you only use the geese, why? Yeah, in our region, the tradition is goose liver. So that's why we do only geese. How long are they out here uh, outside just living like this? Geese live outside during four or five months. So. Like the first four or five months of their life there, yeah. free range entirely. Yeah. They need green all the time. Uh, they, that guy ate a worm. I just saw him get a worm. Why don't you tell me about the tradition of uh, foie gras here in France? In France, we feed the geese since a very long time. Uh, since Egypt, the tradition arrived in France. But here in Dordogne, we are the first producer of goose liver in France. So foie gras is definitely, here in France at least, not an elitist food. 
No, absolutely not. Everybody hit foie gras. Everybody. I mean, I'm sure you know in America, we have a lot of controversy around foie gras. So in California, we have a, a ban on production of foie gras. I'm sure you've heard about it. What do you, what do you think about this? I think that Californian love to drink, love to hit. But me, I can say that people that are against the force fitting don't know anything about that, have never seen how it is done. Since I think the gavage, the force feeding, is really at the heart of what people are upset about, why don't we go see gavage? So this is where we feed the geese inside. Okay, you're not gonna feed them, right? No, not me. No. The specialist is my husband, Dennis. This one is a male. Males are stronger than females. So you see, it's very quick. <laughs> that's for the beginning. The four first days, that's what they hit. In one week, they will hit four or five times more than that. Each, each session, huh? Each, yes. So the corn is all, the corn is not crashed. Right, so you probably couldn't test that on me and stick it down my throat, huh? <laughs> no? no, no, you're not a goose. No? <laughs> All right. Okay, so seeing the gavage, can we take a look at the liver? Yeah, we can see how lab, where we prepare the liver. Okay. Let's go. This, this is the finished foie gras from a goose. Yeah. This is a middle size one, 700 gram. And you can see the big part and the smaller one. This is one liver. So when we open the, 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 the goose, we take off the liver. But now we have to choose which quality is this liver. So we feel the texture. And if this liver is sweet, if it's not too granny, if it's not too fatty. Probably it will be the first quality. So what's this one? This one is probably first quality. Yeah, so how do you tell by... Look, if you put your finger like this, mm -hmm. you can see that it's very, it's, it's sweet, it's... You know, it feels like what we in the United States call sil silly putty, but it doesn't bounce. It like, it gives a little bit, but it doesn't... Yeah, it's not too hard. It doesn't hard. mush. It doesn't, it doesn't go... No, absolutely. And it's not too hard. If the liver is really, really hard, it's not the best quality. What happens if it's too hard? Too much fat, it renders out too much? Yes, probably too big and too much fat. A lot of the anti-foie gras people, what they see here is a product of torture. Yeah. You know, what, what do you see? What does this product mean to you? No, for me, it's the best thing that we can have in French cooking. We're very proud in France to produce this kind of thing. We live with this. We, it's our life. We, we think about foie gras each day. We work for this. We love to hit it. And we are proud. We want to show to the people that we are not bad people that love to hurt the animal, absolutely not. We love our animals, but now... Yeah, all right, let's taste. It's for me? Uh-huh. Oh, I love it. That's delicious. It is? No, it really is. With wine, it will be better. Mm. But listen, Natalie, I feel like I really understand a lot more about how this stuff is made. 
This is a delicious product. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure. You're welcome. I hope you have understood everything about foie gras now. You know everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I didn't know quite what to expect coming and actually seeing the foie gras being made. I do know that the geese weren't as kind of freaked out as I thought they'd be. I feel that we've seen as good as foie gras manufacturer is gonna get. So if you're not for foie gras based on what happens here, I don't think you're ever gonna be for foie gras. On January 7, 2015, a U.S. district judge overturned the California ban on foie gras because it violated federal law already regulating the poultry industry. With this current ruling, the ban against foie gras in California is effectively over. But whether or not it was about the ethical treatment of animals or about politics, Guillermo Gonzalez's farm is finished. But the battle is far from over. Animal rights activists are encouraging California's attorney general to file an appeal. 99% no, no, of the no. justify you, suffering! 99% of the You know who does that? Can Nazis! Slave owners and women beaters! This is That's so who every, justifies suffering 99% of the human beings are eating, are eating meat. How many animals die today? We have just begun!